Hello. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I should make our pre-stream conversations a Patreon or not Patreon coffee. You should actually. We just talk about random shit like Final Fantasy 16 versus Zelda combat and um, Emily's elbow. Also the yeah. Bruins. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Poor fuck. Poor fuck. Uh-huh. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Yeah, the intro is not actually from 15 years ago, but <laughs> close enough. Whatever you want. <laughs> it's uh also the this i thought the sad music was funny i realized my sense of humor is very specific so under Do thieves it's... you know rip. oh yeah one true, out. true it's we're sad because we're under <laughs> thieves I, actually yes i change the music every time we do the intro you guys should come in for the intro every time thank you emily yes okay anyway um playing happened Good times. Um, so, my notes are incomprehensible. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I think. Good place to start. I think we're starting with uh, America's conversation. Um, yeah. So, specifically talking about, when we're talking about the America's conversation, specifically talking about the context of Rainbow Seven and pain gaming's performance at world's play in um yes so everyone has an idea of where we're going i'm really go please take this away from me <laughs> one interesting thing to track uh before i start talking about these two teams individually just to set up context is that with all of the america's talk post uh like final season of just lcs proper um was a lot of like, oh, is this even going to be competitive? Um, I know you had brought up how teams really are sometimes a bit precious about having to scrim LLA or CBLL teams. Um, And a lot of times those scrims are not close. I actually heard going into 100 Thieves matchup with R7 they had actually done quite well against them in scrims, which should have been a harbinger of doom because we all know that this 100 Thieves team only does best when they're like 0 and 17 in scrims. Um, True. But but jokes aside, uh, I think the big conversation around Americas was a lot of LCS fans and teams and players being like, okay, well, this sucks because we're basically going to have two teams coming in. They're not going to be as good. And then we have to face worse teams in the Southern Conference. And um, then, and you know, we, have we to lose give up our world spot. Yeah. Oh, no. And then we have to give up our, <laughs> and then we have to give up our world spot. Right. Um, yeah. And so I again, this is not my opinion. This I'm just paraphrasing mm-hmm. a lot of conversation that went around this. And then the lead up to this which we kind of covered on here not super in depth um especially since it was a fearless tournament and i'm gonna need to learn how to talk about those better as an analyst because a lot of the times i'm just kind of like oh okay um get ready for fearless buddy yeah (laughs) get ready to learn fearless Uh, (laughs) here we go um which is that tournament had pain winning right and it had Dragon Steel eliminated before the bracket stage even happened, mm-hmm. or, uh, and so a lot of people are looking at this, being like, "Okay, does what? Do, what is this like in the context of Americas already?" And I saw a lot of takes that were, "Oh, this is fine. They're just our, you know, these Challenger are just our been, um, is weaker than a Challenger team. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like NA gutted their uh, gutted their path to pro, which is true." Um, but, Mm -hmm. but also, um, so that was kind of the attitude going into this was just like, oh, that tournament was, you know, it was whatever, uh, it's not indicative of what the Americas is going to look like. And then 100 Thieves lose to R7 in their first match in three games, um, where they looked not good at all. 
and then um they do not make it out of the bracket stage where pain and r7 actually end up playing each other for a spot and pain making it uh i thought was really like kind of awesome as someone who has followed CBLOL for a really long time. CBLOL has not made it to, or Pain has not made it to, um, like a a main stage of Worlds tournament since 2015, I believe, when there wasn't a. I'm trying to remember the thing. Was there a play in for 2015? There was the IWCQ, um, which acted as the play in, and that's how they qualified. Mm-hmm. And they ended up in that group with like CLG yep. and Rocks Tigers. Um, so I think uh, as a person who followed the region and has seen kind of this conversation and clash between CBLO fans and LCS fans, I thought it was a really interesting reminder that the these top teams are like can be competitive with, I would say, It's weird because I still rank FlyQuest and TL better than 100 Thieves by like a pretty significant margin. Um, but yeah. I I liked that this happened because not only am I just happy for, for pain, but also um, it changes. I think it changes a bit the conversation around America's overall. I mean, I didn't like that 100 Thieves shit the bed. Sorry, I should rephrase that. Uh, because I love this 100 Thieves team, too. Like, if anyone's paid attention to the show, yeah. you already know that MDK and 100 Thieves are, like, our baby teams that we <laughs> love and want yeah. to do well. Um, and so I'm I'm sad that they looked so bad at this tournament, uh, especially since I was actually one of the people who was like, maybe the meta benefits them because mm-hmm. you can shift mid-jungle, right? And that they should, theoretically be a lot more comfortable executing those compositions. But the only time we really saw that click was with the Nocturne Oriana comp. Um, and that is like the, the conversation around America's becomes a lot more interesting um, because yep. it will be these top teams that will be going to face uh, our top teams. Um, so because there's the Southern Conference with the CBLL concentration of teams and uh, the Northern Conference mm-hmm. with the concentration of LCS teams, um, you'll have the, the actual best teams going. And by my estimation, in watching uh, VODs leading up to it, I thought R7 and Payne were actually two of the shakiest teams mm-hmm. going into this. So to see them like show up uh in a big way and also specifically with r7 i yeah. would say the way that they won was when we were predicting 100 thieves over them the way that they won was the one way that we said they could win which was kind of with summit really really yeah. taking over um so i think yeah i like I do not like that 100 Thieves flamed out. It makes me sad. However, I like that this changes the conversation and makes it a lot more interesting for next year in context. Because I think this should... It's a really nice framework to set up. Um, The already, like... I wouldn't even call it a rivalry, but just kind of like... uh, Mudslinging between two fan groups... uh, and yeah, it, it sets up a lot of really interesting storylines mm-hmm. for next year. Um, I guess the the caveat or the the hopium for NA fans is definitely that um, I do think TL and FlyQuest are significantly better than 100 Thieves. And the, like, I don't know if we want to merge all this discussion together, because it's hard for me to talk about the America's conversation without 100 Thieves, so I'll just end on this. I think, contextually, um, 100 Thieves, this is not me making excuses for them, but I will say that this is a team that, on paper, in spring, um, 
most people put seventh or eighth in summer people also put i think i put them like six uh yeah i put them yeah. six um i think i had them fifth and that was like considered insane hopium so yeah yeah um so this is still i would say a roster that significantly overperformed mm -hmm. uh to expectations and to in a lot of ways like perceived skill level right uh so in that regard it's also kind of not surprising especially with how one-sided their matchup was with FlyQuest going into it like they did I, I remember casting that series and being like, Ugh, like, wow, like they don't have a chance in all three of these games post like a, a certain point. So um, if there's hopium for NA fans, this I do think our, our two top teams are, are significantly better than 100 Thieves and 100 Thieves making it in and of themselves was such a major upset that you then have to look at C9 and be like, what, ha what happened here? Um, but yeah, this is also another thing that happens when major upsets happen. Uh, and they apparently were really confident going into that R7 match. So the way that they played on stage uh, did not live up to that confidence. Um, and that kind of sucks because I wanted to see them do well. But I... The the bright side is that it changes the conversation around Americas in a way that I think is really constructive and really interesting. So, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, I used to be one of the most, most spoken anti-NA people on social media <laughs> because it was very fun to shit on NA when they had hopium. However, something strange has happened in the past several years and that is that NA lost their Hopium. And I would say this year, Hopium has been at an all-time high, so it's very tempting to go back to shit on NA fans. However, I will not, you know, because I would rather talk about Rainbow Seven and Pain um, and sort of the things that they did that were impressive slash surprising. I think for me, when I'm looking at... Um, some of the, the things that like rainbows, they, they played surprisingly well around things like Jackson con, um, and then things like that, that were pretty exciting. I think for me, the, the best things that happened in, and then you saw like a great amount of coordination around rainbow sevens top side. This is something we had talked about before. I think for me, the, 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 or not rainbow seven. Wow. Holy shit. Uh, Pain Gaming's top side, I can talk. My language is English. It is my f first language. Hooray. Um, but the, like, all of that stuff I thought was super fun to watch. I think uh, Rainbow Seven did a really good job of, like, understanding, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to set up for Summit. I also sort of like the, the conversation about how, like, I also kind of want to add the context of scrim culture because I talked about this before, which is that a lot of times NA teams um, just dislike playing against LAT LATAM teams or CBLOL teams, whereas like they're very often kind of up to scrim on LA server f for us, you know, they're, which is like huge ping gap. They're often to like open to playing comps that you, you ask them for. Um, they're very kind of open to, or in the past, maybe not this year when they realized their region is getting gutted. So I don't, I don't know if that changed anything, <laughs> but, um, or first to merge with us and then they'll have to compete in the future. But in the past, they've always been like very, very open, very accommodating script partners. And a lot of times NA teams will just like, if, if you lose to like a, a pain gaming or something in scrims, then it's an instant mental boom because they should be shit, right? Like that's, that's very much the perception that a lot of NA teams will have. And a lot of that I think also comes from solo queue because you'll see um, like LATAM or CBLOL players play. And I remember talking to one of the junglers who, would, who tried out for a lot of like academies, academy teams. Um, my name is, I can't believe I've forgotten his name currently. 
Um, but he competed at Worlds, and I remember from Latam, and one of his big things was he wanted to demonstrate like that, oh, they're actually good. Because he thinks NA players have a lot of negative opinions of Latam players from solo queue, right? Which was... Like, you, you would get, like, Jose Deodo, who people would acknowledge, um, like, almost kind of begrudgingly, but most either CB LOL or, like, Latin players, people would be like, eh, you know, they're just kind of griefing. And I do think Ping, unironically, has an, has an impact on that. Um, the players who are able to climb up, like, very, very high, at a certain point, Ping does become a factor in how well you're able to play. Um, the other thing that I think is a factor is that, like, also when you talk to these teams, and we've talked about this before, a lot of times, especially the lot of M teams will say, like, our internet quality, like, we're used to it being shit. So, like, ping, we don't cry about as much. Um, like, when we get to I IWCQs in the past, like, we don't cry as much about that. So, I don't know. For me, it's just very exciting to see them do well because the idea is that maybe they will have, like, more infrastructural resources if they join like an LCS or something like that. That was one, like a lot of Latin fans were obviously upset about the fact that the region's basically going away, but some of them were like, funding and support's been really bad anyway. You know, maybe this is an opportunity for some players to prove themselves, which I'm not saying that's like everyone's opinion, but it's an opinion that might apply here and might end up surprising a lot of people. So I, I think, I am excited for um, the LA teams and the CBLL teams being able to compete more closely with America. I'm sad that they, you know, maybe we should give CBLL two world spots, you know? Like, why does NA get two? That's stupid. It's not necessary. <laughs> also, I wish that uh, Brazil wasn't BTFO'd from Twitter. Yeah, same. That would make this a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The uh the other thing I'll say just in terms of the R7 pain like final game was actually insane. Um because both teams kind of alternated playing like weirdly hesitantly and then completely overconfidently in approaching a lot of these fights. Uh, and the interesting thing for Pain specifically for me is that I felt like in a few of their games, I'm trying to remember whether it was in the R7 match or I think it was in the first R7 game. Um, but basically they, in my opinion, were at like a massive compositional disadvantage and they still just out team fought. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure it was the... Was it the first game? Yeah, I think it was the first game between them and R7. Or no, because R7 won that. Oh, which game? Sorry, which no, game? No, 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 it was the second game. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I think it was probably the second game. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was the second game. Uh, Maybe it was one of their earlier I mean, games. I don't know. The but first like two games, at least, R7 was like winning early because they were just forcing a lot of things. Versus Pain. Yeah, well, it's... Yeah. Also, I thought, like, there was one specific time where Payne just picked an early game comp, and I was like, oh, they are just going to, like, even when they were ahead, I was like, oh, they're just going to get mm -hmm. eaten because they lost at third Drake, and then they ended up coming back and winning anyway. And I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. This is going to be interesting. Um, and in that series, I think you could see also a lot of uh, things that were concerning about these two teams' gameplay coming into plans, but I also thought you saw a lot of really cool pop-off moments, especially in fights. Um, when you look at the uh, way that um, Titan and uh, Dinkato played in particular, like, they were there were points where they were just having like really cool uh, standout outplays. And I don't know, it was a, it was a really, really fun series to watch. Um, like I, I think like at one point 
everyone was just kind of like, wow, this is a game of all time. Um, but it was a it was a good time. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think, looking at these compositions, I'm not sure how accurate these will be in terms of like predicting the next stage meta. Um, and I do think that Kane are going to have a tough mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, because, like I said, a lot of the ways that they won in this series was through, like, a surprise team fight where they ended up having a really good setup and, like, fought around it very well. Like, they were able to collapse onto R7 and kind of eliminate Raid Boss Summit uh, or Raid Boss uh, uh, Kini before mm -hmm. either of them could do anything. Um, but I don't think they'll have the same level of success in doing that against uh better teams yeah it'll be interesting i think the i don't expect pain to do super well in swiss but i also like didn't expect rainbow seven or pain to do that well in play in so we'll see i think i do one thing that i noticed about play in was and this usually will happen with play in in early group stages is teams that just play like super wombo combo team fights are winning <laughs> pretty consistently like if you have an oriana rumble let's go oriana rumble mf like the the psg comps um then it's like super easy to execute you just get very easy setup and then people will walk in you press your r's and gg um so yeah, I think that that was definitely a, a factor there in how they they work. I am also excited for Oriana Syndra. Also, I can cast in chat reminded me that the jungler I was talking about earlier was Dimitri. Um, so okay. uh, yeah, I think the <clears throat> but um so thank you for that. Uh, sorry, Dimitri, that I forgot your name temporarily. Um, but I think the so that's basically the the tldr on how i feel about the situation i think if i am a brazilian fan i'm even more incensed by the merger now <laughs> if i am an na fan then i'm feeling a little humbled maybe or i'm just hitting the hopium copium even more and saying ah but like west and tl are just way better man it's fine just chill um so yeah uh We'll see about that one. I think also worth noting, like the reason why I said the the thing that I was excited for NA about was lane swaps and one of these. Yep. Are really bad at those. Oh my god. <laughs> that that first game was like, guys, <laughs> have you learned nothing? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> and the not. answer is they have not learned anything. <laughs> anything at all. I say uh, this with like the utmost affection in my heart, but good lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, it's like, oh, okay, uh, lane swaps. If we allocate our resources correctly, we can play for top XP at the same time as AD is pushing. And then we can have the rest of our members do something else, top level XP, like retroact, will we'll TP retroactively when they have enough HP to survive a dive. 100 Thieves is like four man push. Yep. Everyone is level two. <laughs> Banger. <laughs> Let's lose Unlucky. our entire map advantage. Hooray. Um, it's very unlucky. But yeah, good times. So we can transition properly into talking about 100 Thieves. Uh, if you watched hot the opening of Hotline League last night, you know that there's a lot of rumors surrounding 100 Thieves right now. We will potentially not talk about those because Emily gets very uncomfortable every time I speculate about. <laughs> I don't even know what the opening was because I was not able okay. to watch. Uh, I only watched the opening while I was watching our Rocket League match for Boise State last night. <clears throat> but it was basically. There's a lot of question marks about 100 Thieves' position in the league next year. Um, and that's all I'll say. 
Um, I do not like speculating on that. But one thing I did, one thing I did find really hilarious is that where Hundred Thieves is spending money right now is on their COD team. And when Hundred Thieves yeah. League of Legends lost to Rainbow Seven, they did like a massive COD announcement, which I thought was Bangers. just hilarious. Yeah, I was like, good, good distraction techniques, guys. I think uh, Invert even tweeted that out. Like, he's like, wow, this is a good way to draw focus yeah. off of the fact that you just lost at Worlds. I I'm gonna guess that like so most of the time I would think that's intentional because one of these usually kind of know what they're doing with social media, but also I think Nature just really loves COD. No, he I mean he does. So, he's a COD pro. He's an ex COD pro think, and he a probably, very ex like a popular ex COD pro. So it was probably not intentional. It was probably literally just COD. Woo! <laughs> I just thought the timing was like incredibly yeah, funny. Yeah, it's funny. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, that said, 100 Thieves were fun to watch this year. I enjoyed them. Um, I also enjoyed PSG's Twitter is just like continuously fire. The uh, welcome back, welcome river memes on the, the PSG Twitter were good times. It's like, I don't even have to Photoshop this one. Yay! <laughs> so like to the I think it was Gam who tweeted out the Levi thing after yeah, they lost yeah. to R7 mm -hmm. with Levi in the 100 Thieves jersey. Because if people remember, uh, Levi was in the 100 Thieves organization yep. um, forever ago. Um, I thought that was very fun as well. Yep. It was. But yeah. But it was a, it was a good time. I think, um, obviously... There was a lot of, for 100 Thieves, there was a lot of just happy to be here vibes. And I feel like I've said that since NA Finals, which should definitely tell you something. Um, but I also know that they took it hard, right? Like the players individually took it hard. Like the expectation, obviously, for an NA team is not to lose a plane. Um, so I think that that's also worth shouting out. I definitely enjoyed watching them. I think I like shout out to Meech as well. OP is feeling better and I also wanted to add the context that I don't think people realize how low the 100 these budget was um so because I also like to talk about rosters in the context of budget because I think it's a productive conversation to have when it comes to offseason conversations and rosters and we talked a lot about how C9's budget was probably highest spend player-wise in the league. A lot of people have said that JoJo is the highest paid player in the league, et cetera. Um, when you look at 100 Thieves, they have like some names on that roster that you would think are maybe expensive, but I mean, you also have to have the added context of 100 Thieves, of Golden Guardians completely collapsing, right? Um, so River, who would be a player that you would expect to be more expensive, was not really. Um, Sniper was in their system. All, already you had uh, quit in their system already from the previous year so green cards etc were things that were not like added budget at that point for for river and quid um you had uh, tomo was like a last minute addition ayla who was paid more than we could have paid him <laughs> on eg but that is not saying much since our budget was basically dead minimum like like uh, was with budget we were given for the off season was basically like lcs minimum only um so i w i think like with golden guardians opting out and eg opting out 100 thieves were probably bottom to spend in the entire league uh, the only one I'm not aware of is if they were able to pay more than Immortals. I think they were able to pay more than Immortals, um, but Immortals were going to spend more money than, what did they, well, than EG, for example, right? So it's like, oh, absolute bare, bare minimum. It's like, they weren't even going to let us buy visas. So it's chill. Um. <laughs> Yay. <Yeah>, you... <laughs> it's a good time. Uh, so uh, I want to add that, like, I think 100 Thieves making worlds with bottom two spend is super good for roster building trends um, as they currently stand. 
So uh, also, like, I had this conversation because I think, like, a lot of non-NA fans are even less aware of how low 100 Thieves spend was, um, like, namely EU fans, because obviously MDK also has really low spend, and people are like, ha, 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 like, spending more money, ha, 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 MDK made it out. It's like, nope, 100 Thieves probably spent about as much money <laughs> as MDK did. So, good times. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't want to, like, say that to make an excuse or to say that, like, obviously they can't compete. In fact, I'd like to say the opposite. Like, they made top three, bottom two spend. That's very good. Um, you'll probably see salaries continue to go down as a result within North America, which could be good, could be bad. I think right now it's good. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. Uh, enjoyable, good times. That's all I have to say about the 100 Thieves situation at the moment. One uh, thing I also will add is talking to the staff and uh, at the beginning of the year, their expectations were like, oh, if we make playoffs, that's really good because yeah. we have a very young roster mm -hmm. with only one kind of like true veteran player with like consistent... Um, Tier one experience and the only player with international experience, I want to say, um, in yeah. River. And so I think the the expectations for this roster were vastly exceeded. Uh, yep. And the way that they did it was very fun um, in terms of, I thought Grayson and their entire coaching staff did a really good job on the whole of not only drafting well, but like drafting well for this team specifically um, and giving them tools that really suited their players. Obviously, this changed a little bit in summer because they had a lot of struggles with the predominant meta uh, in terms of how this team liked to play versus the way that you kind of typically would play with AP farming jungle and AD mid. Um, however, I thought that still on the whole across the board, they did such a good job of recognizing like, these are the players we have. This is what these players are good at. These are compositions they are going to put them in positions to succeed. Um, and when they failed, it was easy to diagnose like why they failed and that doesn't always happen um which makes hundred thieves a really interesting team from my perspective just because you can see the roadmap of how and why they were successful and i really hope that other teams take a look at this not just from a roster building standpoint but also from a this is exactly how and this is Grayson's rookie year, by the way, as a as a head coach in mm -hmm. LCS level. And him and his like staff smashed it in terms of having a really good understanding of the roster they have and what they can do to put them in the best position to win. Um, and I really appreciate that from them. And so shout out to them as well. Yep. Uh, and I think that it's another thing that LCS orgs who did not do as well or maybe did not make worlds when they expected to uh, might want to take a look at. I also think I mean, to, not to beat the dead C9 horse too much, but um, I think that's what I was alluding to. I honestly <laughs> like, I know that you're alluding to that, but I also think that C9 unironically probably thought that they were doing the same thing um, in terms of yeah. like giving their players the best opportunity to succeed in terms of what they were good at. Because arguably what C9 should be good at is beating the shit out of other players in 1v1s, you know? Like, that's what they yeah. should be good at. They should be good at mechanically outplaying. So even when their drafts didn't make sense and they drafted too much for early game or too much for lane, they probably legitimately thought that that's what they were doing. They probably legitimately thought that they were giving their players the best opportunity to succeed uh, given their skills. Um, so, yeah, I get that's it. Like a I get it, like really depends on kind of how what the players that you have right so the players that you have on 100 thieves are river who's going to 1v9 the 
the map for you and players who are not that good at laning <laughs> around him. So like you're going to get them in ult they're going to put them on ultra comfort where they know how to play fights, right? Um and I think that that's what they did and it was, they did a very good job of that. Um like making it very simple. Like sometimes you have teams where the best way to play is also the easiest way to play. So you just draft wombo combo comps like PSG. And sometimes you have teams where it's like, ah, uh, we're not gonna make it to a team fight, are we? Because we're just gonna die if we don't have early game play champions because my players have no self control. So let's go. Uh, level one invade every game. Um, so yeah, I think. Like, it really kind of depends on the roster that you have and, like, what level of discipline you're able to instill. Um, which, you know, let's meditate, guys. Meditation is fun. Um, and things like that are things that come up. Uh, but yes, I think enough about NA. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about NA, and they're not even going to make it to the next phase, except for TL and FlyQuest, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, I do want to also talk about MBK. We've alluded to a little bit. Were yeah. they supposed to crash? I don't think we said they'd crash and burn. But were no, they supposed to not. crash and burn, Emily? This one, Twitter keeps telling me they're bad. <laughs> no, the uh, fun part is like, it feels like with NA, you have so much hopium this year. And with EU, you have like shitty so, Yeah. So you get this Twitter clash of... NA fans, Hopium, and then EU fans being continuing to say, but MDK are really bad, guys, I swear. I swear they're still bad. They're still bad. They're still bad <laughs> until, uh, until MDK wins Worlds, and then it's going to be funny yeah. because the Twitter crowd will still be saying, I swear they're still bad, guys. They're still bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um... <laughs> Let it be known that this is a, a this podcast has defended EU all year, uh, and also we've defended MDK even when they've kind of looked like shit. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest thing for me out of MDK, which I feel like I've everyone is saying, so it's going to be a really boring take, was. Um, but in particular, their bot lane really showed up in mm -hmm. plans. Uh really, really like literally better over than Deft Super. Overperformed <laughs> uh compared to my expectations. Uh when I talked about where this team could find success, it was definitely more in how um first of all, weirdly enough, I, I think there are a lot of parallels between Hundred Thieves and mm -hmm. and MK. Uh and not just in terms of roster construction and having one veteran leading a team of like less yep. experienced players, but also in terms of the way that mid jungle like to play or specifically the way that jungle likes to play for lanes as opposed to yep. lanes playing for jungle. Um, and so when I looked at where this team could be successful, I'm like, well, Mirwin is one of their best performers. Elioya is going to be more comfortable in this meta because you can play things that affect like affect your lanes more than having your lanes play for you um but uh the what actually ended up happening not, not that that didn't happen necessarily but what ended up happening is that their bot lane showed up and uh alvaro in particular was like had insanely good uh in so many of these series like he really really um his roams were good his setups for team fights were good um his map awareness was great uh all of that was amazing to watch um and i thought that was super interesting about this team going into main stage because if their bot lane is quite interesting that's terrible uh if they're i didn't even mean to do that if their bot lane keeps uh showing up like this it makes them a much more dangerous team right because i think you still do have the things that I pointed out with um, Elioia and Mirwin. Obviously, they have a really tough draw uh, against BLG in the first round. Um, but yeah, I think in the play-ins, uh, the things that I liked seeing out of them were um, 
they're from the very first series, like from the get go. And I don't know how much you want to talk about lane swaps more holistically because <laughs> they are not dead, guys. Uh, and I am probably the only person happy about this. I'm um, happy about it. I love lane swaps. <laughs> But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that's true. This is also a lane swap. Wow, we are just we're so pro, unpopular. We're pro we have Lions so and many lane swaps. We have so many unpopular opinions <laughs> compared to the community. Jesus. Uh, I think. What happens um, when lukewarm takes corner, Emily? Come on. I know. It died. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought their approach to the swap was good mm -hmm. in terms of, okay, we're going to pick Jinx when we swap. Um, we're going to have these compositions where um, we are getting her uh, out of a, either a poor laning phase or just generally getting her into a great spot going into um, the, not even the mid game, but like the early mid game, right? Like basically setting her up for success really early on so that she can contribute to fights a lot earlier. Um, and when we talk about why lean swaps happen, the the now like counter punch. So initially it was lane swaps suck and we want them out, like Rito, please. And now the counter push in terms of the community is like Riot doesn't understand why lane swaps happen. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think that's true I necessarily having talked to people on the actual team. But I also think uh, that some of the levers that you might want to push in that direction are not things they would want to touch. Yeah. There are two things about lane swaps that I want to bring up as a precursor to what we might see for main stage. And I'll bring it up now just because, like I said, I really liked, even though I actually think they fucked it up um, a couple times in terms of swapping back and like lane assignments yeah. after the initial swap, like pretty bad. I liked Mad's approach to swaps with the Jinx. I thought it was really smart. I was like, this is exactly what I predicted to see if teams were going to start pushing in a lane swap direction, if they were still tentative about whether they'd work or not. I thought Jinx was a sick pick for that. Uh, and I really liked seeing that from MDK. Um, again, even though Vikings almost came back because they ended up messing up their lane assignments in a few places. With swaps more holistically, again, why are you swapping? A lot of the times at this point, it's not to fast, fast push turrets. It's about, mm -hmm. can you get an XP advantage on a champion? And so I'm not even pointing out a specific champion. In this case, it's Jinx. But like a lot of the times, it's your top laner. A lot of the times, it's even your mid laner because you're sending your top laner or your support to mid and almost like duoing mid at times. Um, and I think that is also something that people should be looking at. I think people should be looking at what side is the jungler starting on? Because yeah. if you are on a swap and they don't call it and they don't know that you're swapping, your jungler can get a massive XP advantage mm -hmm. if they're really efficient at farming and you start on the weak side of the map, which we've already covered when we talked about FlyQuest swap. But I'm bringing it up again because I do think that these are all important things that when you look at why are teams swapping, it's to get certain champions in really good positions so they can end up fighting earlier through XP or gold or both. Um, which means that when you bungle a swap, like we just talked about with 100 Thieves, it's because you don't do a good job of that. You're splitting too much XP or you're not responding well in terms of lane assignments and that kind of thing. Um, and that is why teams are swapping. It's not too fast. It's like really not to fast push. It's not to get super early turret plate advantages, etc. One thing I do want to bring up, though, that we haven't seen yet, and I am curious to see if teams like, for example, TES with Mr. I want bot tier one down before 10 minutes or I've failed in Mako or T1, which these two teams are going up against each other, who really like fast push, like hard 2v2 bot lanes. If some of these teams will, because of the turret plate discrepancy, mm. try to challenge it with a fast push. That's something I'm really yeah. curious to see if teams attempt, because we haven't really seen an execution on that either. Um, and so that 
honestly, it makes me excited because I know people hate this, but I really love this kind of shit in yep. terms of like, how do we respond to um, a lane swap and why are we swapping? And I think that is all super fucking interesting. And I'm sorry if you don't feel that way. I will try to bring this to the world's broadcast. Like, I mean, not try. I will bring this excitement for for lane, lane swaps, swaps and yeah. for this kind of macro strategy to the broadcast. So hopefully... The, maybe some of my excitement will bleed into the way that people see it because I think also the way we talk about swaps can be kind of bad. Um, calling myself out here too in terms of explaining like how they can mm -hmm. be cool. Yep. Um, but yeah, I thought to wrap this all up and bring it back to MDK, I thought MDKs from the get-go, their initial read on why you should swap picking the jinx, getting the Syndra. Um, I thought all of that was like really, really, yep. really good. And in addition to that, their bot lane performed way above my expectations. Um, and that is a good thing for them as they go into main stage, especially with the draw they got, because they're going up against one of the toughest teams at the tournament, like right off the bat. And... Strangely enough, I think MDK is, in some ways are like a baby BLG. A, <laughs> their mid game is sus in terms of <laughs> setting up fights optimally, and they play for like early lane advantages really hard. Um, but BLG's. MDK's like mid game macro is better, and BLG's team fighting is better. Probably is the, mm -hmm. the caveat. Um, also, to touch on lane swaps, I think like it's no exaggeration to say that I probably would have stopped watching League this year if not for lane swaps. Like I probably at one point would have just given up because it's like legitimately making the game interesting for me, like single handedly at the moment. Not to say that I don't find the other things interesting, but it's just like. After a while, you just get bored knowing, okay, this team has terrain advantage compositionally in these places. Okay, we'll either set up fights here or we won't set up fights here. And if we don't set up fights here, we're probably just going to lose. And oh, wait, look, guys, that's what happened. Oh, my God, crazy. Uh, it becomes less interesting, whereas it's like, I think in a way, when you add things to the game from a strategic perspective that are not always correctly optimized, it makes the game interesting because it's like not solved, right? In a way where it's like you don't have the answer as to what is, and so I think you should be kind of allowing for things like that. Like this is also why people like new maps in, in like FPS titles or pretty much anything, but we've had Summoner's Rift forever good old summoner's rift it's like a like i'm married to summoner's rift but every once in a while i'd like to have a fling with like a map where the bot lane plays against the top lane you know like it's it's one of those <laughs> i love my wife Take summoner's rift but you know uh anyway <laughs> I'm not advocating anyone have flings or cheat on their wives. I'm very actually against <laughs> that, but I'm just throwing that out there. Um, in any case, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been kind of really fun for me for lane swaps. And MDK are a team that like should be good at lane swaps based on their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so again, it's not surprising that that was an advantage for them. Um, I think also for me, the thing that I enjoyed about MDK is like if they're taking like the wombo combo fights we're talking about, they're, they're not doing that but well, but when they were able to split fights, like there was a dragon fight specifically against PSG, uh, where they managed to have um, Merwin and Elioya zone like half of the fight and then everyone else just like killed the other side um, around Dragon Pit. And that was like the turning point for them when they started winning fights. I think it was game one. Um, so like there's definitely ways that they're finding that are creative and also interesting to split fights so that they aren't taking like full 5v5s, which is a refreshing take from them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad BSG made it. I mean, I, I think I'm glad both of those teams made it 
I think both of those teams are interesting. I think PSG does a very good job of keeping lanes pushed in sides. Like, the side landing Oriana was almost comical. Um, <laughs> it reminded me of 2021 20, RNG, which you know, is always a good time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go MDK! Woo! At least one of our baby teams made it out. <laughs> go Mad Lions, go Lane Swaps, go Europe. Hooray. Um, speaking of none of those things, uh, <laughs> Gigabyte Marines. Thoughts. Or GAM, sorry. They're no longer GAM? Gigabyte Marines. They're no longer Gigabyte Marines. They're just GAM. Um, we got the GAMs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 How many people are even going to know what that means? That's something like my grandmother used to <laughs> Well, I've often been told I'm old, so it works. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, do we underestimate GAM? Um, I did. I'll say that. I think, but I think the coolest thing. Uh, and I said this after they qualified for main stage, is that this team really stuck with the roster that was kind mm -hmm. of of circumstance. Like, it was an emergency substitution roster because of the match-fixing scandal that kind of rocked all of the VCS. And when they were at MSI, they did not look good. Um even with that win that they got uh, over loud that you like, you could tell how much it meant to them. Similarly, how you could tell how much it meant to them to even win the VCS and get to MSI in the first place um, because of everything that happened. And it was apparent that um, the three players that they had added really hadn't integrated with the team well. I thought other teams did a good job of recognizing almost immediately that Kiaya was obviously the strongest point on the map and just attacking him over and over. Right. Mm -hmm. Like they made it really, really difficult for him to play the video game. And because the rest of the map wasn't really coordinated or up to snuff, and these players had only been playing with Levi and Kiaya and each other for a very short amount of time it did not end up looking good, right? Because you take your one strong point off the map, the rest of the map can't mitigate it at all, and you lose. And that, the difference in terms of how much more coordinated they are as a unit was really cool to see after seeing um, their performance at MSI and how much this team has improved, like, on the whole. Um, I also think that it helps that Kiaya is the best top laner in this play-ins. And he absolutely proved that. So as a as a longtime Kiaya fan, uh I, I know like Merwin fans are probably gonna get pretty mad at me, but for saying that, but like I think Kiaya was absolutely uh the best performing top in this in these play-ins. And I am really happy for him in that regard as someone who's thought he is really, really good. For a very long amount of time and uh i also think that the way that the rest of the team looks so much better um it is like it's it's cool it's cool to see that they actually stuck with this roster and ended up kind of evolving together um i also think that you shouldn't even though it's not like a i don't think shivana is going to be like a power pick Levi's understanding of how to path on that champion and set himself up to yeah. be in a really good position for grub take to level six or to be able to contest Drake, depending on, on what side, is really good. Mm -hmm. He is very efficient on that champion. I just don't think that... I think all things considered, ban it. Uh, just because he is so... Yep. so ridiculously comfortable and like if you follow his actual pathing and his xp levels early you can see why like he's actually just so efficient and knows exactly what to do on that champion um and if you're wondering like what makes you know 
what makes Levi's Shivana different? Like, just watch him from levels one to six, and I you can't will see why. I have to explain this to you. Like, I just fucking watch it. Like, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like, because like, Shivana, be Shivana became such a meme, right? That it's nice to see like a a player actually understand like this is this is how I should play, and like this is how my team is going to play around Shivana. Um, after it became a meme when like so many LPL and LCK teams were slamming it, and then like they would just end up with the Shivana who would be in the middle of the fight taking damage <laughs> and dying. Um. So yeah, it was that was cool to see, and and also you know, all things considered, if you're going up against Gam, just take it off the table because it's it is something that you it is a win condition that they can have that you really don't want to give Levi as as their other like kind of top performer on the team. I mean, the other thing that I would say it's like all of the stuff we were talking about, where it's like fighting them like fighting and, and all, all, like all the lane swap stuff it's like just fight them you know gam is just fighting them all the time everywhere i think the one thing that i liked about gam a lot was um like you said like if you if you predict a team or a jungler who's going to l farm for six before first grub spawn after they delay it's, it's probably by um like gam have very historically played for Less rush jungle XP as much as possible, and this is a good meta for it for sure. Even if like a lot of the AP junglers were nerfed, they didn't nerf jungle XP, so it's which we've said already. And then I, I've always been kind of like a, a low key poke Shivana fan in terms of AP. I know it's not exactly the same build. It's like a oh we're gonna hold this flank when you walk into river and press R on top of all of them the difference so uh i liked it a lot they were also like very good at sometimes i think they kind of over complicated their fight setups like there was the one there was the one game i watched i think it was versus r7 where they were holding angle like on the the catwalk um by the dragon just on the one side of mid and waiting for enemy team to walk into river and they like use their rumble ult insta and then they used all their cc and then lost the fight um <laughs> it's like ah oh, they will walk into us and we will get the perfect wombo and then they lose okay oh. whereas like if they're just running at people they're usually steamrolling them it's a good time um so i think yeah gamma really fun I didn't underestimate them because I knew of the glory of Emo, the greatest player oh, yeah, that's true. in League of Legends. Sure. Only I underestimated them. <laughs> I love Emo. Emo is my favorite player. And I say this because when I was watching, doing the, the VOD review prep for, for MSI, Emo, it, like you could actually see Emo improve game to game. And it was like very fun, so I became an instant emo fan for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's still doing pretty well. Like, he's obviously not the star of the team, but he does his job pretty well, and he's playing Yone, so hooray. Oh. <laughs> that champ's gonna become my favorite by the end. Uh, the champ is broken. I've been saying this champ's broken for two years. And finally, the world agrees. Yay! Yone. <clears throat> um, but yeah, we did want to talk about a little bit about things that are happening. Did I miss anything? Are we... Do we want to talk about APAC at all? Um, or I need to... Uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> like, the saddest thing to me with APAC is still... Or not the saddest, but... um one of the saddest things is that we still have no idea like what is going to happen with Oceania um, because yeah. of their incredibly big we are restructuring <laughs> um, what does it mean thank, thank you LCO fans it's like okay what is even happening um, but the lost in kind of the um Lost in kind of the Americas, 
uh, I don't know, fight between Seville and LCS fans, I think has definitely been just how much the APAC region is shrinking. Yeah. Um, like, this is by far and away the most, the largest amount of teams that we are losing. Um, and there are, like, I, I feel like people will point to stuff like the VCS match, mm -hmm. match fixing scandal that happened earlier this year, right? Or um, just a overall lack of money and resources for any teams that aren't top teams and even top teams uh, yeah. don't always have the same support that uh, a North American or European team or, and, and you know, to go further, uh, an LCK or an LPL team would have. Yep. Um, but it's really sad to me because, I mean, like, I under so all that is to preface and saying, I understand why this is happening monetarily um it's sad to me though because like the for people that don't know the first league in league of legends overall was the gpl yep. um and this was like way way back at, at the very beginning of league of legends and the like I, I don't know, the way that so many of these teams from either, like, first GPL, then LMS, uh, now PCS, the top teams in that, uh, most of which have been Taiwanese teams, and, like, the spirit of Flash Wolves lives on in Maple and Betty going to main stage. Um, but a lot of these teams were always able to, at least for a game, when the discrepancy between in particular, South Korean teams and the rest of the world was a lot wider. I think, like, I still think LCK and LPL teams are significantly ahead, but it used to be a, at a point in time where, like, South Korean teams were so far ahead of everyone else. Um, and I do think some of these, uh, some of these PCS, PCS LMS, GPL, whatever you want to call them, teams were actually able to punch up, uh, if not in season two, like win worlds. Yep. Um, and to me, that is such a big part of League of Legends history that, like, I guess just because I'm from the US and <laughs> mostly surrounded by English speaking community and LCS fans who are really uh you know kind of sad that this is closing a chapter on lcs specifically but like i do think so much of the context of how important a lot of these teams have been to league of legends history has been really lost because as i say very constantly uh we are not good at canonizing our own competitive history for league of legends and in particular i think a lot of the context of how uh scrappy these uh like yep. older uh gpl through pcs teams because they've already been restructured so many times yep. could be has been has been kind of lost um which is sad and i mean in a way that's why i touched upon this last episode but i think it's really appropriate that even though psg are most likely going to be around next year. Um, I think it is appropriate that these players and and this team is representing like that uh, that region as its own standalone. Um, because yeah, I don't know. I, I have a soft spot in my heart for for the region, even if I haven't followed it as closely as a lot of other people have. Um, and the massive amount of teams that we're losing to make APAC is, I, I mean, it's, the, it's definitely the greatest culling of League of Legends teams that we've ever seen. And it's 
Like it, it, it could be, but it could also not be, and it most likely will be like a great culling. But the yeah. the way that the league like it's very vague. Like the, the the information to English fans has been very vague, and I'm sure it's not that much better to be able to speak other languages in the area as well. But it's um, very much along the lines of like, oh, we'll have these feeder leagues. And you'll qualify based on performance to like the main league, which is kind of what exists now, but not really. Um, it's more similar to the GPL, which would have like preceding leagues that would feed mm -hmm. into GPL, but spots were guaranteed by region. And the like the disadvantage of that was like you ha were guaranteed to have like one team from Thailand, which sometimes would be Bangkok Titans. Uh, you were guaranteed to have one team from um, basically like Vietnam. You were like a certain amount of th like the biggest ones were obviously Vietnam and then the Macau, Macau Hong Kong, Taiwan region. Um, mm -hmm. And then you had the like ever like the Philippines would guarantee you have like one team, right? Um, you would have like all of all of these things. And then a lot of the LMS, like, region teams would complain because they were forced to have so much competition against these shitter teams or whatever, <laughs> and, <laughs> which would kind of, like, dilute their season. Um, and then they consolidated a lot more and gave a lot more of the spots and the preferential treatment in terms of, like, international events specifically to the PCS, right? And then, which was the, the LMS, or whatever you want to call it, like it was LMS, and then it was PCS. Um, but now I think it will probably go back to some things resembling GPL a little more, but the spots will not be guaranteed regionally. It'll probably be performance-based. So you'll probably still end up with something like a PCS that's smaller, because it's like six teams, I think. And then a bunch of teams their big tournament will be almost like an IWCQ style event. And then as a result, a lot of people who own teams uh, will probably want to downsize, right? Like a lot of people who would own like a Vietnamese team, team or um, like an LCO team would probably want to downsize because the chance that they'll be competing at the main stage that qualifies for Worlds is very small. Um, so that's kind of the way I envision it playing out. Uh, again, like, we'll probably have more specific information as it happens. Like, for more context, like, the, the region historically was controlled by Garena. So if, if you follow, like, high school Le League of Legends, it's similar to how Riot gave the rights to a bad actor um, for like high school NA League and it thro did its part to contribute to the throttling of the high school competitive scene. I would argue that Garena did its part to contributing to the throttling of the APAC region historically. Yep. Um, like poorly run servers, poorly run like tournament designs that were very grassroots, etc. Um, and not, and then the grassroots people were not allowed to live, uh, <laughs> and I don't think they're gonna execute anyone. But you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, <laughs> I think the, but in general, it's just one of those, like, untold stories that's just of like what APAC could have been. I think. Um, and then, especially considering the fact that the Vietnamese server is still one of the top five largest servers in League of Legends, <laughs> and we've done fuck all for a player base that's very dedicated and loves the game, uh, so I don't know, it's just sad. I think, narratively though, if we wanted Riot, like, people to be mad at Riot, this is probably the best possible play and outcome. <laughs> we get a CV ball team out. We get a, a VCS team out. And a we've given team we've out. given power we've given power to all of the regions that Riot wants to eliminate. Yeah, exactly. And now all of the fan bases <laughs> oh. will rise up. 
Let's go. <laughs> also in Europe, because people love flaming Europe, so that's funny too. Um, anyway, sure. <laughs> if Europe didn't make it out, though, arguably, and we got like VKE or R7 or something, that would be arguably even funnier. Uh, one other thing I wanted to posit to you, Emily, was how good are GAM when no other team in their side of the bracket made it out? And they made it out by 2-0-ing both of their opponents. <laughs> They'll be interested to see yeah. them. Yeah. They go up against FlyQuest, right? Um, yeah. So that will be entertaining. Um, like I said, ban Shivana, please. Uh, but then also the the most interesting thing in the FlyQuest matchup, and the biggest concern, I think, will be topside. Um, but I do think you can destabilize GAM by recognizing just how frequently they do want to fight. Mm -hmm. um, and again, a lot of the setup for those fights is getting Levi in a really good position through inf efficient farming yep. uh, and having his lanes uh, be strong enough to cover or just having them position in a way that allows him to, you know, kind of go undisturbed for a while until he can get into a good position where he's entering a early to mid or mid game fight in um, an advantage that you might not necessarily expect him to have. Um, I think in general, FlyQuest uh, specifically inspired should be able to recognize that um i consider him a very very intelligent jungler and just a overall very intelligent person about the game itself um so i think he'll be able to recognize that uh he's pretty good at tracking his jungle opponents and understanding what they want to do and when um the biggest like not coin flip, but like the most interesting matchup in terms of lanes is definitely Bwipo into Kiaya, because like I said, Kiaya was the best performing top coming out of plans. Yep. I think he is really, really strong. And I think Bwipo kind of tends to have either really, really good games or pretty poor games. So the, you know, the, there is a definitely, a world where Kiaya ends up taking over that lane specifically, and then it's a matter of how FlyQuest end up dealing with him and, and what comp they pick. Um, overall, though, I think Gam still showcased how you can beat them, again, which is essentially like forcing them into disadvantageous fights or just playing the map better overall, um, which FlyQuest should be able to do, uh, theoretically. Um, theoretically. But yeah, yeah. I, the, like, they haven't... I, and I think the reason why people are still, like, kind of down on FlyQuest to the point where they're still talking about TL as if TL is the first seed, which they're not. Um, it's actually FlyQuest. FlyQuest won the finals. Mm -hmm. um, is that in even in their wins they don't look they don't always look as dominant as like team liquid has looked in some of their wins and so i think that has allowed people to like undervalue FlyQuest in a way um especially when we were looking at like their lane swaps versus tl swaps i thought they were still doing a lot of really creative things yep. with their swaps that people weren't necessarily recognizing but might have looked sloppier because of mistakes made by individual members um but yeah i think i think this is a tough opponent for gam for those reasons because and i i do think if they end up beating FlyQuest, it's going to be because maybe kiaya ends up taking over an entire game or kiaya and levi end up taking over an entire game so you basically started the conversation of the next talking points which is what are the most interesting matchups for you, right? Uh, going into the first round of the Swiss stage. Uh, since we probably won't be able to talk about every round of Swiss stage, 
but we can make we can have a few conversations about basically what the fir- most interesting matchup in the first round and then maybe sort of how we expect it to shake out but like for you what's the most interesting match that you want to watch are two actually mm-hmm. and one i think is not one that people are going to be pointing out necessarily um one is one that I think everyone's going to be looking at, which is the TES T1 oh, yeah. series. Yeah. Um, mainly because uh, all those things I said about lane swaps earlier and bringing these two teams up, uh, these are two teams that I would say are my two biggest contenders for if a lane swap happens, these are the teams that are going to try to contend it with a fast pushing bot lane that just absolutely destroys bot tier one like super super quick um these are the two teams that i think really prefer in particular with their bot lanes having a bot lane 2v2 uh and i also think generally even though t1 have looked incredibly shaky throughout summer um and even in their qualifying run to this tournament i This meta, like, it it can't be understated how much this meta really, really suits them. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas TES, by contrast, I think could look potentially worse in this meta. I'm, like, kind of, I'm weirdly undecided because Mm -hmm. I know Cream is really, really good at um, melee mids. Right. So like uh I think he'll be comfortable with stuff like Kali, Silas Yone, if it comes yeah. back, Yone, stuff like that. Um but I also am unsure as to whether TES will be able to how they'll be able to play with uh with Kareem on those champions as opposed to AD mids, uh, in terms of how they were playing. And then the other interesting thing is like I said, I think this is a team that probably wants standard lanes or wants to contend it with like a really really strong bot 2v2 scenario or just a really strong bot lane um and i actually think t1 also want that like to the point where that was how they dictated the meta at worlds last year so um that to me is a really interesting matchup with specifically on this patch because I'm really, really curious to see both of these teams on this patch based on the players that are on their rosters. Uh, the other one I wanted to point out was the uh, PSG HLE mm-hmm. matchup. I think this one's really fun, actually. Uh, I enjoy watching both of these teams play. Again, uh, on this meta, I thought PSG actually had a really terrible meta read uh, for their first uh, two series um, and are still kind of getting their their feet. Yeah. Um, (laughs) We'll see. Uh, But I think (laughs) if they continue to look at the way uh, this meta could go, I think that's a pretty interesting matchup, mainly because I just want to see the uh Jinja Maple mid jungle go up against uh the Peanut Zeka mid jungle because I think that's just a really cool matchup that I am interested to see. I don't know if other people are, but I want to see it. Um yeah, I don't know. I-, I think this could be a fun match. Oh, let's see. I mean, I I think TSC1 will be interesting in terms of lane swaps because TS, I think, canonically were the first team to lane swap for jungle XP at MSI mm-hmm. last year or this year, whatever. All one year. It blurs together. together. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they were, and they were actually very good at the lane swap in terms of getting Jackie up to level three and then playing for kills versus TL, actually, I would say. Um, so yeah, that's interesting to me, and I think T1 still suck at lane swaps. So I think if I had to pick one, I think T1 would probably be the one who's trying to fast, fast push bots. Um, and then I also think TS 
ball landing hasn't been as good this summer as it was. Uh, Jackie Love just like inexplicably dies sometimes. <laughs> it's it's super fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, like obviously TS are winning worlds, so I'm sticking to it. So you said KTU are making worlds, and T1 stomp that down. Yeah, so stomped now stomped is definitely how I would describe that five game series where two T KT were up in game five. Yeah, I definitely uh... stomp for sure. Um, I got to I got to stay on the T1 train now, you know. <laughs> I haven't left the TS train all year. I'm not about to, so it's true. Just what it is. Um, yes, glazing will continue until morale well, improves. Yes, I think. Interestingly enough, I really like TL LNG. <laughs> I think it'll be very interesting. Um, Again, because it's so difficult for me to properly predict LNG, I also don't yeah. know how much they have the how much of the scout situation affected their practice time. Um, like, were they practicing a lot with Yagao or not? I don't know. Um, and then you also have like when we talk about what happens early on in the map, LNG don't really do anything except like play lane right like they they're basically loading into solo queue for the first 10 minutes of the game and they're just playing their lane phase and they're very upset when teams like try to coordinate things before the solo queue period of the game is over and then they like play fights and stomp people with their lane advantages right um so i th i think like the matchup is similar in some ways to tl fly so i do think because i think TL are pretty... No, it's not similar to TL Fly. It kind of is. Okay, to explain this, I will have to say that... I'm confused. TL are... I think TL are, like, very good early game team uh, in the context of NA, and they usually do that through coordinating their plays well. Specifically mm -hmm. with their, their jungler understanding how lanes will go. Um, and then I think, like... Fly slash LNG will like come in and play team fights, um, or like make game decently well. Uh, so that's why I think it can be interesting from that perspective because LNG don't really coordinate their early game, and also both of their logos are blue and have like horse like creatures. So um, uh, <laughs> there you go. Dra dragon versus horse. Yeah, um, it's a Kieran technically. Which yeah. I don't exactly Here. know the relationship with horses that they have. But. Uh, <laughs> Kieran in their clouds, in, in the clouds rather, is their slogan. Yeah, I think they're it's, it's, it's um, and it's um, it's Chilin, 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 and then they're they look like deer dragons or something. But anyway, horses close enough. <laughs> <laughs> um for for me i'm gonna say i think tl surprise should lean swap uh uh but also i think the most interesting thing is to your point how much practice lng has been able to get and also seeing lng in this meta because to further your point it's not even just that they load in and they just want to lean standardly for a while but it's also after that phase the way that they move scout specifically around the map uh, especially when he was on 80 mids to take turrets and sides was kind of their bread and butter for most of this split um and that's why we had already talked about what losing scout does uh and and like theoretically what putting yeg out in that position would do because he's kind of the opposite right where you're not relying on him to stomp lane and make mid yep. this massive pressure point for your jungler and then go to sides with your incredibly strong mid laner and just push charts down right like yagao is kind of the opposite where he is a lot of the times punting his laning phase to help lanes a lot earlier um and i don't know how much they were able to practice with scout but i also think in this meta not that Scout can't play mages, because he absolutely can. Um, but the way that they've played all of summer, I think 
uh, might not work as well, depending on what kind of early laning advantages they are able to get uh, with the compositions they ended up locking in on this patch. Um, and in that way, the in for TL, if they want to beat LNG, is definitely through, I think, swapping and having a better understanding of early to mid game lane assignments to really disrupt what LNG want to do with getting Scout into a good position where he's then just like taking side lane turrets. Yep. And, uh, okay. So what's your spiciest result take? Like, who do you think is going to win that people might not expect in the matchup? I mean, I don't know if it's a spicy result take. Have any spicy results? I'm trying to think. Could Fnatic beat DK? <laughs> that would be the banger. Oh uh, <laughs> god! Well, because like, because like the, the way Europe, the Europe sucks crowd will really lose their minds. <laughs> I know, uh, because the way that happens is just both teams devolve into posturing each around each other in mid and like looking for a fight. Right. And then it's a matter of like who wins that fight. Um, but I also think this is a, in particular, a really good meta for Showmaker. Yep. So I'm not sure if that would happen. It's but if that game. Too, but yeah. yeah. If that, if that game devolves into that, where it's just both teams like kind of like crab walking around each yeah. other in mid lane, which I can absolutely <laughs> see happening, by the way. Yeah. Um, there, there's some upset potential there, even though I'm still going with DK. I'm, I feel like I'm pretty boring across the board in terms of who Both I'm of picking their logos to win. Kind though. of look like crabs too, kind of. <laughs> anyway, oh, sorry, uh, it's it's like 8:30 in the morning. It's, I need to get ready for my next meeting. Yeah, it's one of those mornings. Um, yeah. Actually, I've been on one this entire like past week because I've been waking up at like four in the morning. Um, and I can't go to for some reason I can't go to bed early, so I just haven't been sleeping. Uh, which is kind of normal actually. Yeah, it's but, sort but... of normal. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I also think TL can beat LNG for the reasons I just said, which I think would be considered an upset. Um, is it though? Like and I was I... thinking about this. Like, is it that much of an upset if TL beat LNG? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it is. Uh, but I also am thinking that T1 are going to beat TES, and I feel like that is also an upset, but the perception of T1 is one of those weird yeah. things where everyone is always like, well, T1 always show up at Worlds, and like they're defending World Champions and, and all this other stuff. Um, so I'm not even sure if picking T1 to beat TES is like a super hot take in terms of the community. Analytically, it might be, uh, even though we haven't seen TES in a while. We just talked about that matchup and and where I think T1 can get advantages. Um, but on the whole, my picks are not super spicy. Yeah, I which was, is like, uh, which is like normal for me. What even is an upset even anymore? Do upsets happen? Hundred thieves making worlds. <laughs> Was that an upset? I don't know. I I can't I don't know anymore. Hundred thieves. Wait, hundred thieves beating C9 absolutely was an upset. Was it an upset? Yes. <laughs> but I didn't have C9 making worlds since the start of summer. So did I have two? Wait, who else did you have? Energy, because I had that stupid narrative where Cerny would join. Remember? Oh, Even yeah. Though I okay. don't actually think that would have made the mid worlds, but I actually, it was more like I didn't think C9 would make worlds. I just had no idea who would beat them. That was like the problem I was having. So, yeah. I mean, that was kind of like the R T1 going to yeah, make. Yeah, it was the same thing with where T1. I was like, I was like, T1 are going to make worlds because their competition is KT. Like KT should have won, goddammit. <laughs> Kwong Dong falling off a cliff. Fuck you, KT. Um, yeah, that's how I feel most of the time. It's a it's a good year for me to be mad at every single esports team and sports team I like. Um I'm mad at the Bruins right now. I'm mad at the Reds right now. 
I don't follow the NBA that much. I guess he'd be mad at the Celtics. My expectations for the Packers are bleh. Oh, kind of whatever. Bleh. Fuck Packers. Fuck KT. Yay. I love you, KT, but fuck you also. <laughs> But isn't that normal in a relationship? You fuck the person you love. <laughs> definitely. All right. This is definitely one oh. of those things where things have been. This going. is a great. This is a great episode. <laughs> yeah. This is gonna. This is gonna be one of the ones that randomly ends up on Reddit, and people are gonna be like, "What the fuck are they talking <laughs> this about?" Is shit. Um. Yeah, I think like I like the fanatic DK one. I think that was fun. I don't. I don't know if I agree, but I know like the the opinion on DK is kind of at a weird spot. Um, I, also... I mean, I'm still picking DK, I like, don't... but I, I'm still picking DK. I just think if it devolves into team fights, depending on composition, mm -hmm. that's like where Fnatic can theoretically do all right. Arguably, these teams are like interesting, have a lot of interesting parallels because it's like the showmaker versus humanoid show in some mm -hmm. ways. Like the, the junglers, depending on who you ask, like Razork is, is considered like the shining star of the team. He's a bit younger. Lucid is the rookie jungler that you and Chronicler staunchly defend. So... Um... Remember? Remember in spring <laughs> when you learned... When he learned how to play Rel like 50 minutes into the game and had that one <laughs> yeah. really sick was a banger. engage at Dragon. It was the best part, yes. <laughs> uh, and then, I don't know, their bot lanes are... <laughs> well, their I mean... carries, I guess, yeah. Are continuously under scrutiny. <laughs> for for, for un, different for reasons. For very different reasons. <laughs> Let us make that clear. <laughs> Uh, and then well, their top laners are. Is not. And their top laners are. Yeah, I've definitely stretched this analogy, but I feel like for top lane and yeah. mid lane it works, kind of, because Oscar and Kingen are both kind of like happy to be there. <laughs> um, I think when you're looking at these teams, it's it's yeah. about mid jungle. Um, yeah. Aiming is having a career year, so that has to be pointed out, like in terms of. <laughs> in-game performance um and the the biggest sticking point with their bot lane is definitely moham uh although initially if i remember as they were like announcing the team going they announced kellen as their starter again and announced moham as the sub but they've been playing more with moham so that's who I expect to be starting. What if King Gaming beat G2? That would be a banger. Um, <laughs> it's difficult for I, me to see happening. I can see it. If we get like a G2 completely with the early game situation, the problem is, yeah. is that Pain also completely with the early game, and then G2 will just out macro them. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the the main issue is like when Pain biffed their entire early game, um, and then like lost at third Drake, and you looked like it looked like they were doomed, right? And then they came back in team fights. That's the point at the game where I think G two recognize how to be able to play mm -hmm. the map better, so they don't even get into a position where they can have an advantageous team fight. Um, if G2 decide to fight early before they should, uh, I think Pain will absolutely take that um, and try to run with it. But then, yeah, it's, it is still difficult for me to see Pain mm -hmm. overcoming the fact that G2 just have significantly better map awareness. I don't know, man. It's like... What would be an upset that would actually happen? MDK could beat BLG. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I'm we've like seen what... I'm here squinting, squinting at the screen trying to convince myself, so, yeah. I mean, we've seen what happens. Like, the... 
so it's weird there's a blueprint for every single one of these upsets that yeah, doesn't mean they'll happen like, but like if you tell me that mdk beat blg i can be like oh blg we've seen what happens when they like underestimate their opponents we've seen even in the finals like even though they won that game on had like one of the most atrocious like individual performances in that series that i've seen in an lpl final um so like it's possible right like i I don't know alvaro alvaro gaps on uh mirwin has a weird counter pick into something bin <laughs> wants to do they yeah, lane they swap have to I, I don't know they have to win through lane like that that's the only way yeah right? and I, I don't really see them doing that um the like the the funny thing is is it's like i think this is what i mean by are there even upsets anymore because it's like if you tell me that X team beat this team and it was unexpected by the community, I'd be like, oh, but they could have, like, from XYZ. Which yeah. is why I think the, the TSG2 series from MSI was, like, made me mauled so much was because they, it was an upset because it was in a way that was, like, almost completely unpredictable. Like, the yeah. method in which they beat them. Not so much that G2 won. Like, both of us were saying it was going to be a very close match. But it was like the method, method, which it wasn't even, but uh, the method in which G2 beat them was like the upset for me. So I think for me, it's like yeah. for, a, for a game or a series to be an upset, it not only has to be the team that the community doesn't think will win winning, it also has to be the way in which they win being surprising. Um, so I guess like yeah. that's why for me, I'm like, eh. Was it really an upset? Like that's it's like always kind of my immediate reaction when people are like, "Oh my god, it's so crazy," you know, and just like, eh. But I think I need like also to feel like the way they win is surprising. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But I think that's like the most fun part is the speculate in predictions is the speculation of not only who will win but how the disadvantageous team will win, which is why I very often will predict. A disadvantaged yeah. team if I think it's like a 40 60 or something like that, right? Which is like when you look at TLO and G, I feel like it's a super close matchup. Um, like TST1, definitely. I think PSG HLE is not that close. I don't know, but but it's fun. Like that's kind of your take, right? The two mid jungles go up against each other. I'm still favoring HLE in that, mm-hmm. but. I mean, I think I'm picking the favorite and not I think. I am picking the favorite in these matches, I'm pretty sure. Obviously, Weibo will be true. Uh, except just... for, I guess, TEST1, depending. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm Who is the it. favorite in that one? That's like probably why it's the obviously the most interesting one. Is just, It's like there's not really a favorite, I think. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Weibo will beat Genji, so we got that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to explain. I think, that one. I think Wave, Wave are gonna get clapped <laughs> by Genji. I think we do, but... <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. Fnatic DK might be the the one. The the banger into yeah. like both teams just posturing for team fights. Yeah, and, and everyone on Twitter molding. That could be. That could be the one. I don't know. Swiss is always fun. Like, you'll always get, like, something surprising. So, I'm looking forward yeah. to that. Anyway, I think um, that's pretty much what we got. Uh, yeah. We go to meetings. Yeah. Woo! I'm going to take a fast food break and then um, do some coaching. So, it should be fun. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe to the coffee. Maybe next week, if I'm feeling it, I will record our pre-conversation. But now that I've said that, it'll probably be a boring pre-show conversation. And so, yeah, you know, we'll see. Or we might be at another weird time because I'll be flying out slash working. Yes, we'll we'll figure it out. So we might not, yeah, we might not be able to do another one of these until after Swiss. Hopefully not, but we'll see. Yep, depends on when the breaks happen, so. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good one.